I'm very fortunate today to have Mark Graham of Holland Cherry with me. How are you doing, Mark? I'm very well, thanks, Jeremy. Um, it's good to see you again, and thanks for having me along today. So, Mark, why don't we start uh, by having you tell us a bit about yourself? I'm regional director for, for Holland Cherry in, in the Far East, so that covers uh, quite a large area. Um, based in, in Shanghai in China, we've got a, got a showroom in the centre in the Jing'an area. And that acts as our, our base for, uh, for the Far East region. Um, that region covers Japan, which is, which is our biggest market, and China, which is our fastest growing market, also Hong Kong. Um, down, in, down here into Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Vietnam, Singapore, Philippines, as well as some smaller markets like, uh, like Taiwan. So uh, since when has Holland Sherry been this present in Asia? Probably, it's really only taken shape in the past four years. Um, we've had a presence, we've had a joint venture, um, but uh, in, in China we haven't been so active as, uh, as certainly a lot, of, a lot of other people have been, but now we recognize that uh, there's, there's, there's a growing demand for, for quality luxury products. The, the kind of demand that we've seen in, in Japan for the, maybe the past 30 years, we now see that up and coming in, in China. I've always wondered what the history of Holland Cherry is. Um, well, it's, it's a very long history. It's 182 years, and I, I don't profess to know every single detail. But uh, it, it, it started 182 years ago. And of course, today in London, the, the center of, uh, of bespoke suiting and, and, and fabrics is, is Savile Row. 182 years ago was Golden Square. Golden Square was the very famous hub for, uh, for textile merchanting in London. And Golden Square is not far from where Savile Row is now. It could only be, it's just, it's just across okay. Regent Street, so it's only about 200 metres away. But it's quite unknown to menswear enthusiasts, Golden Square. It is, because it's, it's, it's not known for, uh, for textiles anymore. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, so that, that's where it all started. We had uh, um, Stephen Holland and, and Frederick Sherry, um, hence the name Holland Sherry, and those two guys got together to start was what was at the time a small wool and silk business and uh, that grew and grew and grew, of course, uh, as we know. Um, and the Sherry's left the business quite early on, after, after 15 years. And the Hollands were in the business until quite recently, actually. Um, so most of that 182 years, it was a family business. And we moved from Golden Square, which was the textile hub, that moved to, uh, <coughs> to Warwick Street in London, and then ultimately to uh, <coughs> Savile Row became the place for textiles and bespoke tailoring, um, which um, changed from a doctor street into what it is now to uh, to uh, a hub for textiles and, and bespoke tailoring. And during during those years, we developed, we grew, we bought about twenty five companies. Um, we had twenty five, so, so we've got about twenty five brand names which we use. Um, not all of them are operational, but the biggest one, of course, would be our, our factory in, in Yorkshire, which is called Clissold. And uh, at one point, we bought uh, what is now our base, our operational base, in the south of Scotland, in Peebles. Um, and that's, that's where we employ 125 people. That's where we, we stock 8,000 different yeah, different I know, because when, when I get these parcels <coughs> from, from you guys, it's all from Scotland. Right, yeah. right. And uh, I guess the name Peebles is, is something you see a lot, but you, you would not have heard of otherwise. That's right. Do you see regional differences in the sort of cloths customers favour? Absolutely. Um, Japan, New York, London, very classic. Okay. You know, they love the blacks, they love the, they love the navies. Um, they, they, they might go brave sometimes and go for a stripe. Um, that's why we have um, collections like uh, Portofino and City of London, which would serve that kind of customer base. Um, in the likes of um, Korea and, and China, where this kind of business is relatively new, first of all, bespoke tailoring is quite kind of new, and they don't necessarily have a suit culture. So culture being that you just wear all one colour to work, for example, um, in a culture where that doesn't happen, they want to stand out more. They want to stand out for a couple of reasons. They want to stand out just to stand out, to be fashionable, to show their friends, sure. of course, like everyone else does. Yeah. But also, there's a move away from, particularly in China, from going down the high straight to the luxury brands, to the Prada, the Gucci, the Armani, 
and spending a lot of money on an off-the-rack garment. And the thing that they can show from that is the brand name on the inside or the outside or whatever. There's a move that's become boring for them now. Yes. There's a move from that. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And it's, it's, it's good for, our, for us in our kind of yeah, business. So. They move to having their own garment, whether you call that bespoke or whether you call that made the measure. It's for them. So the pattern they picked out themselves, they, the lapels are just for them, the buttonholes, the, the notches, the lining, the cut, the style, everything is just for them. And if it's just for them, they want, they, they're not going to pick a, a navy, they're not going to pick a black, they're going to pick something very loud, something maybe from our Ascot Classics or Extreme Collection, something like that. Impact goes down very well in China, which we can't really sell in other places so much. A huge competitor to the British cloth industry is the Italian cloth industry, mm -hmm. clustered around the north of Italy. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are famous for uh, very sensuous cloths, mm -hmm. so very soft and uh, with, uh, with sheen mm -hmm. and uh, tremendous creativity. So between British and Italian cloths, how should one go about picking between the two? What are the strengths of British cloth? Well, uh, one thing is you don't need to pick between the two. You can have both. And uh, I, I don't see them necessarily as competing industries. They're different. You know, uh, yeah. People know what, uh, what British cloth offers. People know what Italian cloth offers. British cloth has, uh, you know, has a, um, a tighter construction. It's got more depth and body to it, um, which leans towards a British tailor making the classic British suit. Whereas Italian cloth is generally more, more colorful, a looser weave, sits softer on the body, and there's 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 times and occasions for anyone to wear wear both those suits. So Mark, we have here the Monat bunch, and uh, you'd, you'd like to tell us a little bit more about the Monat. How does the name come about? The name uh, Monat is, is is simply Scottish for moor, um, the place uh, where the, where the sheep graze. And uh, the, the reason, of course, it's called uh, uh, Moor in Scottish is because uh, it's Scottish Merino, which is exclusive to Hull and Sherry. So, of course, most Merino um, is the Merino breed that came from Spain in the, in the 1400s that, uh, that was held by the, the Spanish crown. And eventually, when it was released by the Spanish crown, uh, uh, some countries in Europe, they, 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 they'd send it to Australia. Um, and of course that's where it thrive and that's where probably 90% of, uh, of fibre for luxury suitings comes from today. And of course the merino got better and better as time went on, as the treatments of the sheep went on and they, uh, they really thrived in, in, the, in the conditions in Australia, you know, the sun and, and the, the dry conditions really helped them. But you know, some merino did stay in Europe. And in fact, in, in Scotland, there's only one flock of uh, merino sheep. Um, we're not allowed to tell you where it is, but Hull and Sherry have exclusivity okay. to, uh, to, the, uh, to the Scottish merino. Um, and to make it that little bit extra special, we've, we've blended it with, uh, with silk. Um, it gives that, uh, that merino more strength, more shine, uh, makes it unique. Um, it's a great cloth, it feels good, it hangs well, um, 250 grams is, in Asia here is, is, a, is a weight where you can, you can wear all year round and be very comfortable. Do you have like a sort of like a annual or biannual cloth fair, the way there's uh, Basel wool fair for watches, mm -hmm. fairs for cars, where you announce new, new collections, new models, uh, is that such a thing in the cloth business? Yes, there is. Um, I guess the two key uh, exhibitions for luxury fabric in the world are Premier Vision in Paris and Milano Unica in, uh, in Milan, obviously. Um, they're key for most people to launch the new products. For us here in Asia, it's Intertextile, oh. um, which is twice a year, spring, summer, autumn, winter in Shanghai. So what, what new collections have you launched in, in previous fans? Um, so we launch twice a year. Um, every year we, we uh, take about 10 collections out put about 10 collections in. Um, this year we've got uh, um, lots of you know, classics coming in. We've got uh, um, Target and City of London. One interesting collection that uh, we've added this year 
is called uh, Goswick, and uh, it's it's a very exclusive um, quality, and we've been working with NJ Bagwan to to uh, identify which which tailors in the region it'll work for. Um, Goswick is a farm, in fact. It's a farm six hours outside Sydney, six hours drive to the east, a little bit north, um, near near Armadale, Urella. And uh, there's a few things about this farm, and of course, the, all the Goswick fibre comes from this farm. Um, number one, we have exclusivity on the farm. Um, so we plan to launch more and more of this, this, this special Goswick uh, product. Um, the sheep are treated very well. Um, it's family owned, it's been family owned for hundreds of years. The sheep are fed well, um, they're, they, they graze well, the pasture is rotated regularly. Um, as we were discussing before, they, uh, they're, they're, they're shorn regularly to keep them healthy. If it gets too cold, they're brought in. Um, the two key things about, about uh, getting a fine fibre and a good crimp on the fibre is the breed of the sheep and the treatment of the sheep. And uh, we've got that just right with Gostwick to launch a, uh, a Super 170s collection, which is also very wearable. You can travel with this suit, you can fold it up, it'll recover very quickly. Well, it reminds me of uh, what I'm wearing right now. This is a uh, Carlo Barbera Super 150s. Very nice. It suits you? It is, it is incredible. Yeah. It is uh, practically crease resistant. I, I don't know how to do it. It's it, it's probably the the crimp a high level of crimp yeah. in the fiber from the sheep. It is not a high twist. It is, yeah. it, is, it, is yeah. uh, it has none of this. Uh, some cloths tend to have seem, seem to be impregnated in some mm -hmm. some kind of finishing, which sort of like wear, wears off. Uh, yeah, which does wear off, which is very frustrating. Yeah. Um, but you're right. You know, there's no reason now why you why you can't have luxury and practicality. Um, you've demonstrated in this suit. We have the same products. Um, people don't want to wear suits that are going to crease easily. You know, people are busy. They sit. They sit down in trains and planes and taxis. Yeah. Well, th th there are also a category of uh, cloths which are crease resistant. They are mm -hmm. the high twist cloths. Yeah. Various degrees of twist, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but they all sacrifice on uh, softness and flow. So, what's special about uh, perhaps the Goswick and definitely this color Barbera I'm wearing is mm -hmm. that. It's a, it seems like a very conventional Super 150s, yeah. but it's, it's crease resistant. Yeah, you're right. Sometimes you do have to sacrifice. Um, sometimes to get that crease resistance or quick recovery time from a suit, you've got to, uh, um, there'll be a lower grade yarn involved, there'll be a looser construction, um, and yes, there might be a bit of artificial finishing, um, neither of which you know, we, 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 we like to do. But uh, sometimes, and, and that kind of fabric is fine for someone who wants an everyday suit, a workwear suit, a travel suit. They don't need it to be luxurious. But for someone who wants the luxury and wants the crease recovery, um, you know, you can do that as well. Um, and that's all about the quality of the fibre, the high crimp in the fibre. Um, so the likes of our Cape Horn um, will, as you say, have a high twist. That will allow for the recovery in that kind of cloth. But in a luxury cloth, where you can't do a high twist, or it would be inappropriate to do a high twist, um, you need a high quality fibre with a high level of crimp. So thanks Mark, thanks for coming for this interview. Thank you Jeremy, thank you very much, thank you for having me.